This is Into Healing, and I'm your host, Mira Adura. Today's Into Healing guest is Anthony Hope. Anthony likes to push limits in everything he does, whether it's creatively at his LA-based design studio Ernst, or in his passions for skateboarding, BMXing, and car racing, all things fast. But when a life-altering car accident disabled him from the chest down, suddenly there were different limits. Anthony's story truly shows us how sometimes our biggest challenges teach us the most about life. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us for more transformational healing stories. Anthony, I'm so grateful to be sitting with you today, and for so many reasons, but first and foremost, because you're alive. And I know this has been a very spiritual, emotional, physical healing journey for you, and I am so honored that you are sharing it with us. Oh, well, thanks for having me. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. Hmm. I think, yeah, you missed that painful, I think. Did you say painful? Oh, no, I should, <laughs> okay. I should have added yeah. painful. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get into the pain of it all, for sure. Um, to start, can you just tell us a little bit about how and where you grew up? Um, I grew up in uh, mostly England. Um, like my father was in the army, so we used to sort of move around a lot to a lot of army bases. Um, so yeah, I grew up like mostly sort of south of England. Um, we did a stint in Australia for three years. Um, but yeah, mostly going on my dad's postings. but. Ended up in my early teenage years in London, um, and then spent most of my, the rest of my childhood and teenage uh, years in, in London. How was it being, you know, moved around the world, and how was kind of your I family it, life like? It, it's what you end up knowing, right? That's mm -hmm. what you end up knowing is the... And actually, my, my parents, they put us in a, in a boarding school, so, mm. um, so from a very early age, they put us in one, they thought if they put us in one school, it would be a... This is in England? Yeah, yeah. So we went, me and my brother got put in boarding schools while my parents moved around and oh. the army subsidized X amount of it. And um, my grandma helped out and stuff, um, just so that we could hopefully get a proper education mm. kind of thing. So we didn't necessarily live in all the places. We mm. lived in one So did you feel, country. do you feel boarding school kind of helped you have that stability? Was it something that you liked or not? Um, it's a hard thing to answer. Mm -hmm. Well, because it's what you know, right? So it's kind of, I mean, I think it helped me grow up at an insanely rapid rate when I was like seven and a half and mm -hmm. you're not around your parents anymore. Um, you create some resilience through doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but no, and then actually what was interesting about it was then you get um, a foundation of friends that uh, it's not like a regular school where if you see some kid crying, you're like, ha ha, he's or she's crying, you know, mm -hmm. he, but he's crying. It's more like, hey, we don't do that here. Mm. Like, just try and keep the emotional bit sort of inside you or just don't, you know. It was more of like a looking out for each other kind of thing I felt with a lot of my friends, um, as opposed to a regular school where you might have, you know, I mean, obviously bullying happens everywhere, but mm -hmm. it was more sort of taking care of each other as a group kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's kind of... Did you miss your parents when they would travel, go away and come back? Yeah, I mean, of course, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of, and then when my parents moved to Australia and I was in England, then that was the bizarrest mm -hmm. thing of knowing that your parents on the complete mm -hmm. polar opposite side of the world. Um, mm -hmm. But but you get on with it, right? But in the same time, it gives you experiences that you would never experience otherwise. Like I I used to fly out every holiday to, to Australia as an unaccompanied minor at like mm -hmm. eight years old. So it then gets you in the way of the world of like, oh, this is how airplanes work. This is how this works. How can I try and do this or get more snacks and right? <laughs> or forget the stewardess to feel sorry for me, bring me whatever I, you know, kind of that's it's so. So, I mean, I think it's like anything, right? You learn boundaries and learn different things. And I was lucky enough to have that as an experience, you know? Mm. Um, and I don't know any different. So, I mean, I probably would have loved going to a day school and seeing my mum and dad every night, but mm. just had a different, different way. Yeah. So. You have a history of living on the edge. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, you know, can you tell us where your love for all things fast came from? Fast cars, snowboarding, BMXing? Um, I think it's like a lot of it's being out in nature. 
and then trying to push and see really how fast you can do things. Um, like going around, and I know it sounds but trivial to normal. where did it come from? Like, when did it start? Where did it come from? I have an older brother, so we always, and I was like the crash test dummy. Like if they set up a jump, I would be the first one that went and did it. And then, oh yeah, that's broken. He crashed. Let's do it differently kind of thing. So I think I was always chasing my older brother. You know, he was a, he's a great cyclist and we always used to ride bikes together. And I think it sort of started there. And then also the car thing too. He was in, into cars and mm. it kind of slowly. And then, yeah, the, the adrenaline side of it too. Like I love jumping things. So like not cars, but I like <laughs> jumping bikes and, you know, I've always been into like dirt jumps, BMX dirt jumps and racing and um, yeah, just a, I don't know, yeah. How did of, that start with like being in boarding school? Were you, when did you do all that stuff? Like right, so it was completely repressed actually. I started like when I left, so I got sort of removed from boarding school at some, in, you know, when I was about 16 and then I pursued uh. all my cycling and all the things I wanted to do that I couldn't do at boarding school because it was more like traditional sport, like rugby, football, yeah, yeah. hockey. So, I mean, I did all that stuff too, but it was more these, I don't know, there was things about wheels. There's something about the, and getting in a flow state. I don't know whether, like you go at a certain speed and you can kind of get in a flow state where you, you can kind of just go ridiculously fast and hold it all together somehow. Um, I don't know, there's this, there's this place, and I'm sure if you talk to a lot of athletes, they, they get in that space where it's like, your adrenaline's at peak, your mind's at peak, and you're so focused on what you're doing, and it's like second nature kind of thing mm. of how you do certain things. And you kind of, yeah, almost get in, more sort of integrated with nature, as it were, like where you understand like, okay, I can't push that hard here, or I can't push that hard there, but I can do this and mm. find a way to, go a little bit faster here or something or not break or yeah learning how not to break <laughs> <laughs> so kind you, of a... you said after you broke kind of free from boarding school and maybe it was like a repression right. that like you suddenly were free do you feel it was like all the emotion that maybe you didn't get to feel suddenly you're feeling it at like in a heightened capacity well I, I think it was more like getting to do what I wanted to do oh. for for once where it was like, it was literally like going to, I don't want to say prison, but it was kind of like mm. that because it was so organized, everything the way, you know, from the age of seven, I had to wear a tie and a mm. shirt and a blazer and all that, you know, always wearing the uniform kind of thing. And it was trying to, I think it was really the stark opposite of that and getting mm. out of that was really kind of, but I don't think it was like a conscious thing. It was like, I was a kid and I was like, I just want to go ride bikes. Yeah. I don't want to do this anymore. You want to be free. Kind of Basically, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and do things that I was interested in doing, um, which leaving that school really, really helped me do, so. Um, That's cool. Um, what does the date December 11, 2018 oh. mean to you? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that's when I had a huge accident and uh, I prefer it not to have happened. No, I try not to hold dates as a, as a thing, you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, it gives me a bit of anxiety. <laughs> we'll see. But I mean, this year's the fifth anniversary, so we'll see how I am on the on the fifth. So, um, although on one of the dates I did actually go up to the crash site and look off the cliff, and mm. on the on that date, and was like, okay, I fell off here three years ago, and uh, this time I managed to walk to the edge as opposed to before I've driven up there and I've had to do it looking out the car window because I couldn't walk. So, how do you feel um, when you go up there? Um, just that I was lucky that I'm not dead mm. and that, um, yeah, just shit happens sometimes, you know, and that nature's still there. Everything's still there. The birds are singing, the sun's out, clouds are out, whatever. The mountains are there. It's still the same place. It hasn't changed because I've done a certain thing there. It's, 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 yeah, I try not to, I think try not to hold on to too much of whatever it might be, you know, like mm. the fear or danger or anxiety or anything. I try to release all that stuff and not make it a point, you know, mm -hmm. um, just cause I, sometimes it can be too heavy, you know, especially when I was in <clears throat> the early stages of my recovery, I couldn't, I couldn't focus on that stuff cause it's a negative thing that, 
would do me no good and help me in no way. So I really try to release a lot of that stuff. And, um, do you have pictures of what happened, of the car and what happened? I do, and I maybe do, yeah. you can tell us a little bit what right, happened. Right, um, Where do you want me to start? Wherever you want to start. So I have this magazine that these guys did a great article about my, my business and then also just my accident. But um, <clears throat> I mean, there, this was the before and the nice car and then this is the after with the, the devastation of <laughs> the burnt oh out God. car. Um, and then these pages here show you kind of where I went off around here. And then this is the, obviously the fire coming from my car and somehow these guys took a photograph of it. Mm. These were the, the rescue guys who I still need to go visit. And my, my, my promise to myself was I was going to go visit them once, once I could walk again properly and go out there and see them and kind of joy. I'm going to get a little bit upset, I think. Mm. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, those guys were great and save, help save my life. So, um, yeah, it's pretty, oh man, I didn't realize this was gonna make me upset, you know? Um, but yeah, and then, I mean, and then there's this one of like the actual in there where I'm just like, oh man, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's a little bit heavy when I look at it sometimes. Um, I mean, I was the fittest I've ever been in my life. So it was almost interesting that I think if I wasn't as fit as I was, I probably would be paralyzed and my spinal cord would have been completely, you know, obliterated just because I think, cause I was so strong, like in my torso that it, it kept my body in one piece. Mm -hmm. um, cause even after the accident, when I was crawling out of the car, it was just dense shrubbery. And I knew I needed to get away from the car cause of the fire. Um, and I knew the shrubbery would go up once if someone didn't get there in time to put it out. So I actually tied my legs together and pulled myself through the undergrowth. Um, and it, yeah, I just put a lot, lot of it to my, to my core strength and the fact that I had muscle on me. Cause when they asked me like, how have you managed to get from there to there? I'm like, I crawled and they're like, well, your back was broken. Your vertebrae was completely exploded. How did you not sever your spinal cord crawling? And I was like, well, I actually did a couple of forward rolls through there too. And I was just like, if I would known, I probably would have laid still, but I was like, you know what? Like I'll take being paralyzed over being burnt to death. So I just kind of just, you know, army my way out with the, you know, kind of, yeah, it's kind of like I went back to my dad's kind of army sort of mentality sort of thing. So, um, how, what happened? How did you lose control of the car? What happened? Right. Um, walk us through so we understand. Um, yeah, just before, I mean, probably about, couple of minutes before the accident, I was driving back up this road and I knew the car was leaking. I could smell it. And this is a race car that you have. I mean, it, it, it's a, it, was a, it was a track car with license plates on it. I mean, it was road legal and all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, it was a bit of a, it was a quick car. Um, but yeah, it was, it was leaking oil about sort of a couple of minutes before and I got out to check it. And I think that's kind of where the, it kind of started from where I think the oil was leaking onto the tire. And that's kind of why I lost it, like around the corner. So I basically went up and there's a, what would you call it? It's not a hairpin, but it's close to a hairpin corner. So it's kind of a long sweep. And basically I lost the rear end of the car. Um, and I think it was the oil and it slid out. And I was put in a position where I, basically I thought if I spun the car, I was gonna hit the wall and then bounce off and go off the cliff backwards. So I held the skid to a certain extent and the car just split left. Mm. It was an uneven road too. I mean, there's lots of factors. The tires weren't the best at the time. Um, and they would, I mean, basically the car was, I was limping it back to the shop is where it was about mm. to go, except it. And you weren't going very fast. I was going about 40 miles an hour or something. Um, and that was actually the speed, probably the only time I was actually doing the speed limit once. Um, and so I, yeah, I ended up going off the edge, uh, going off a 200 foot ravine um, and staying sunny side up the whole way, which was, which, which was, was my goal. Once I knew I was going, I knew I just had to keep my head up and I wasn't going to roll kind of thing. So, cause I actually had a friend who rolled his truck off a hundred foot cliff and the whole cab collapsed and he laid down on the passenger seat and rolled off. Um, oh. 
but he managed to crawl. Anyway, that's another story. For, <laughs> for, um, so when you knew the accident was happening, if you, when you knew you were going to go off the cliff, you intentionally stayed sunny side up. Like, because I knew there was a cliff on the other side. Mm -hmm. I just had no idea how big it was. Um, and I was just like, I'm not going out on the brakes kind mm -hmm. of thing. Because I knew if I hit it, I was going to either flip that way or flip sideways. Um, and yeah, I think I said before, there was a grass verge and I basically just gassed it. And uh, Paul Dukes a hazard. It's kind of like when you go on a roller coaster, right? And you, I mean, even the cop was like, oh, you fully Dukes a hazard it. And I, I actually cleared the rocks oh my and then landed on the downslope. So it kind of worked out, <laughs> luckily in my favor. And it was kind of like, you know, when you go on a roller coaster and you, go over the precipice, right? And you get that like, oh shit. And you go off and, except I did about three of those because there was a lot of air time. <laughs> so it was like, so it was like a lot of old shits and then just hit the down slope. And then on the way down, it was like, it was like one of those bad Disney movies where the, they go through the jungle and it's like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. it was like that, right? With shrubbery <laughs> and, and somehow I missed, because if you go and look there, it's a creek bed, so it's all boulders. And there's boulders on the side too. And I was like, I have no idea how I've managed to avoid all the boulders and not land in the boulders and somehow land in the tree at the bottom, which kind of broke my fall a little bit and then flipped the car over. So I don't even um, know how you do that. How do you stay in the air? I, I mean, it wasn't intentional. It was like <laughs> I had created, an, my, my logic was from, cause I used to, you know, race downhill mountain bikes and jump 40 foot jumps and stuff. and same with motorbikes, maybe not jump them so far, but, and even snowboarding, you know, if you like launch yourself off a blind thing, you kind of know where you're going to go land it. So I, I kept on the gas because I knew I wanted momentum. And the logic was that when I landed, I wanted the car to still be moving so it wouldn't break my back. Because mm. I knew if I went on the brakes, it would drop the back and stop the car. Mm. So I knew I wanted to keep going. Um, and I think that's what might have, not completely obliterated my spine mm. um, was by having the forward momentum. And in that, I, I, I don't know, I, it's so quick that you, you, but I'd like to think in my mind, cause I was steering too, like just kind of aiming for, kind of the same way you do on a bike. You use the, the force of the wheels to help you guide it. Like if you're doing a jump on a motocross bike, you can use the brakes, right? To dip or lower the front or the back of a bike. And the same in the car, it's like, I just stay on the gas, steer to where I want to go even though I'm in the sky and it kind of works. <laughs> where I'm like, all right, I'm going in that trajectory. It's almost like you've trained for I that. I mean, it was, yeah, right, right. It was like, it was almost like that. It was all my knowledge just kind of came together in milliseconds of like, this seems like a good idea, <laughs> right? And you just kind of do it and it, and it worked. Cause I can't work out how I didn't just go straight off and land just at the bottom, mm. you know? Somehow I kind of curved it a little bit and got to go round and sort of land it a little bit which is, I, I don't know. Wow. I don't really know what the answer is. Cause it was literally like milliseconds, you know? Um, and then it was almost like a annoyance at the bottom where I was like, really? On a Tuesday morning, like I'm here, like I was like, really, really? Like this has happened? <laughs> oh. um, so it's, uh, sorry, back to your so question. So you were fully conscious. Oh like, yeah, 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 yeah. You were yeah. fully conscious. Oh, I'd just come from the gym. So I'd done an insane like workout for an hour and whatever. And so I was fully pumped up for whatever. So You've the adre adrenaline, was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> adrenaline was going. I was fully, you know, kind of, yeah, it was ready. And yeah. And then but the, o the, o yeah, the only thing though in the beginning was because I was sort of limping home, I wasn't really concentrating. And it was the only time in my car I wasn't really concentrating. Mm. And that's why I think I kind of lost it because I was, thinking about my day, I was gonna go cash these checks and for mm. work and stuff and and I wasn't focused. And I think that's mm. that's when you, I don't know, I, so going back to your speed question is I found like, if you actually go really as quick as you can possibly go, you become insanely focused mm. and you have like this really quick split reactions. And then it's almost like I wasn't in that zone. So, I feel like that's kind of, and I wasn't going at a speed where I could have done something to mm. it. So it kind of caught you off guard. Yeah, completely. I sort of checked out that day and I was like, all right, I'm just going home kind of thing. Um, so you landed, you landed on a tree. So I landed on a tree. It flipped me upside down. The car was upside down like that. 
Um, was it like that? Anyway, so I still had my harness on. Um, the roll cage saved my life. The roll cage hit my head right here. Mm. Um, I had a bump on my head. Um, all my worldly goods were in the passenger seat and they're all strewn everywhere. Um, and I think I just, you know what I did? I, I remember now. I actually did like yoga breaths and I was mm. like, I just did five big, like massive breaths. And I was like, you got this. Let's get out of here and start moving. And I basically unclipped myself, hit the roof because I was strapped in upside down. Um, didn't know that my legs didn't work at that point. Looked at all my goods. Goods, like there was money, there was cash, there was checks. There was checks. <laughs> there was there was um, my favorite sunglasses, my cell phone. And then I saw the fire in the back, oh. and I'm like, all right. And I could hear it crackling, and I'm oh. like, all right, I got to get out of the car. And then I remember lifting myself out, dangling off the edge of the car, looking, peering back in. Like I pulled myself back up and I was like, should I go get my stuff? And then I saw the flames in the back and I was like, whoa. So I actually grabbed, I had a little fire extinguisher in there. I tried to put it out, the, the flames kind of died, but it was an oil fire and then just came back up again. And I was like, all right, I don't know what could blow up right now. The fuel tank, I don't know what could. Yeah. And it didn't eventually. I probably could have gone back and got the stuff, but. And then I lowered myself down um, and then realized my legs didn't work. And you lowered yourself down from the tree? I lowered or? myself down from the car because the car wasn't completely flat on the ground. It was like half in, half up. Uh, okay. um, but it was probably about six foot still off the ground. Um, and so how did you lower yourself? Just slowly. Just been in the gym, right? Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> another set of pull-ups. So I just lowered myself and, uh, and then, yeah, I lowered myself onto my legs. I'm like, that's weird because my legs just collapsed under me. And, you know, I just literally come from doing... Oh. working out and I'm like how is this what is going on and then I was like this is really annoying <laughs> it's uh, yeah I remember like basically edging back from the car seeing the car the fire looking at my feet and being like oh they don't work anymore oh. and it wasn't there wasn't any pain either it was like I think it was pure adrenaline and then um yeah just pure adrenaline I just I didn't feel it and I was like and I knew I was like, right, I got 15 minutes. I got 15 minutes of pure energy and adrenaline. What am I going to do next? Um, and so it was fire season, right? And it was December. All the shrubbery up there was really dry. I saw the fire and I was like, I don't know whether anyone's ever going to know I'm here. Mm. I obviously don't have a phone. I got to get out of here before I get smoked out of the, because it was a little valley too. Mm. Um, and I was like, this is going to burn all the way through. So I actually crawled and that's where I got my one and only external scar was um, or on my arm. Um, I got my belt, I tied my legs together because I couldn't move, my, my legs were just like jelly. Mm. Um, and just crawled through the shrubbery, did some forward rolls to get through some weird stuff, kind of crawled about 70, 80 foot and then went up this ravine on the other side where I could get a vantage point of where the cars kind of overlooked. This is all just with your hands? Yeah, yeah, just all with my, and then some guy turned up and he was like, he saw the fire. He looked down and he was like, he was looking at the fire and I was like, hey, hey. And I had to kind of go like, hey, hey, like repeatedly. And I could see him like looking around like, what the hell is that? And then he saw me and he was like, you know, what the fuck are you doing down there? And I'm like, oh, that's my car, it's on fire. I need some help. <laughs> can oh you come, God. can you come down? It's like, a... and he's like, no, I don't have self-service. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get help. And luckily the, the, the rescue thing is literally a mile, not even a mile down wow. the road. So he went and got the rescue guys. In between that, there was three people that um, they stopped there. He flagged down some people and three people came down. Um, and like I said, there was a, it was a creek bed, but with massive boulders. And I was on this side of it and these guys came down. They're like, we're not going to move you because we don't want to be liable for breaking your back. And I was like, look, I can't feel my legs already. So you're not mm. going to do any worse. So. I prefer to be paralyzed than be burnt alive. So can you just take me over here? Mm. And they did and they were great. And then and then the mountain rescue crew came, put me in one of those kind of bed things. Mm -hmm. Actually, this was kind of funny. Um, so it was a really steep incline, right? And they're coming down with like ropes and stuff. This one guy knocks one of the boulders 
and they're all focused on me and I'm just like, yo, there's a boulder coming. And it wasn't, it was like a, this, oh like it God. was like a, that one might kill me boulder. Like oh if you didn't die there, the boulder might kill you kind of thing. <laughs> and then, so they skewed the bed over and then the thing just went and I was just like, whoa, that could have been like, <laughs> someone's really out for me today sort of thing, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, and then the helicopter guys came and did their business, you know, picked me up, put me in the helicopter, took me to hospital and kind of went from there really. Um, and then trying to remember people's phone numbers without a cell phone, right? Oh. And it's like, trying to, <laughs> that, was, that was a tough one of like, they're asking me like, well, so who do you want to call? I'm like, um, I don't know anyone's, <laughs> so it's know all, all, yeah, right, 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 right. Oh my God. So it was, but eventually it worked out, so. Um, just going back to when you, when you couldn't feel your legs, what went through your head? Um, nothing really serious because it was more like I knew I just had to save myself. Mm. Like I know from all the accidents and stuff I've done on bikes before that you've got this 15 minutes window of like adrenaline mm. and after that you're going to crash, you know, like even it, it wasn't a thing of like, oh, I think I'm paralyzed. It's like, how am I, what's the next mm. step? I can't focus on this right now mm. or otherwise just need I'm to just going to be stuck here. Yeah. Um, and then in my mind, it was like, you know, I sat down for maybe a couple of minutes. I was like, at what point do I start climbing? Because I don't think people can find me down here. Oof. So I was like, all right, I'm going to have to climb that, that whole kind of, you know, mountain face there to get up to the top or otherwise, because I don't have any water, I don't have any Oof. food. I don't have any way to tell anyone that I'm here and I'm Oof. in a really weird, and I can hear cars going by too, oh. right? But I'm deep in this ravine and it's like, so it was more that of like, right, just knowing how much energy I was going to have and knowing that it was December, I wouldn't survive. And I could survive a night, but it probably wouldn't be very pretty mm -hmm. afterwards. So it was like, I'm going to have to crawl out of mm -hmm. here. When do I do that? And so that, that was more my, more my thinking. Yeah. Um, and then also, why don't I have my phone? Because that would be the best photo right now of my car <laughs> burning. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, we always right. want our phones. <laughs> right, or I wish I had a GoPro to film that <laughs> stunt. Yes, uh... Oh my goodness. So what was the chain of events that led to surgery? Um, so helicopter guys came. Helicopter guys came, put me on a big tray, sort of checked me out, did all the body scans, have to go in the big... Cat scans. Cat scans. They tell you the bad news. Um, what they was tell the bad you, news? Uh, I exploded like my T12, um, just shattered it. Um, and then also there was splint, some of the splinters of my T12 were going towards my spinal cord is what they were saying. So they, um, and they basically said that I had to wait till the, cause then the swelling starts, right? Your body mm. just goes into full like emergency mode. Um, mm. And then the pain start. Yeah, yeah, like in hospital, that's when the nerve pain just goes and then it's on, right? Um, so everything from my belly button down or from the injury or from T12 was just on. Like it was mm. like car battery just plugged in and here you go. Um, and so we had to wait two days or a day and a half till I could actually go and have surgery till the swelling had all gone down. Mm. Um, and then it was two rounds. It was first of all, the incision in my spine where they opened me up and they basically put in a fake vertebrae um, and then they put in eight bolts and two titanium rods in my, in my spine. Um, and then the next one after that was then to cut into my side under my ribs and put in the front puck that would hold the, oh, the, back. the, the back together. Um, and, and that's probably the worst one. No one's the most painful oh. one. Um, and yeah, just dealing with that. I mean, it was, but at that point you're on so many sedatives and mm. medication and it's, um, it's hard to kind of keep track of it, you know? Mm. Um, but it was like one of those bad sci-fi movies because I woke up in the, I think the bit when they bring you out of the operating theater. First of all, I had the, in the operating theater where they put you on a metal slab. Mm. And I just remember being freezing and be like, and being like, fuck me, it's cold in here. <laughs> and then there's a lot, yeah, right? Yeah. And then on the way out, I got a, 
I don't know whether it's in my imagination, but it was almost like a bad version of Star Wars or something where I was just on this metal tray mm. or one of those alien movies when mm. you get abducted and I just woke up like, what is this? Like, whoa, it's... um. Mm. But yeah, it, 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 just insane amounts of pain is, 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 is all that really, yeah, all I can really remember from that time and just begging people for drugs. Mm. Like the, the nurse is like, can I have my next fix now? Because they give you it in like however many, you know, you get your... Um, what is it? What do they give to you? Like morphine would come in six, six hour doses or something, right? But you need it every hour, literally. Oh. And then, and then there would be the other drugs, which are like, oh, but you can have this. And it's like, what? It's like, you know, it's like throwing a feather at a fan kind of thing. It just, there's no point. It's, mm. it's almost pointless. So it was like days of that. And then the pain was so bad, we used to have to put ice on it. And then I got ice burns and it was all these oh. kind of... So how long were you in the hospital? This I want to say about, yeah, hospital. I want to say about three weeks. Three oh, wow. weeks. So all the, the ice burns and all that was in the hospital? Yeah, yeah. Oh. And then, um, yeah, then they're teaching you how to manage the catheter and at that point. So yeah, you go from fully functional to, I can't, you know, even have like a bowel movement and yeah. like just trying to go to the bathroom is impossible having the catheters inserted, um, it was, I mean, even trying to eat, right? It, it was, it was like, mm. yeah, I, I, it's, it's difficult to explain because your world becomes this big, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm just trapped in this space and I'm at the mercy of all of these people trying to help me, which was, I mean, it is, and the job they did, I mean, they're amazing. The nurses were outstanding, you know, mm. you know, as much as everyone gives healthcare a hard, Hard not, they were the nicest people, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was yeah, just insanely painful. And I, I think I couldn't believe the amount of pain. Like I've done a lot of things to myself. Like I've injured myself <laughs> and broken arms and legs and fingers. And But the level of pain was beyond anything I've ever had to register. And I think my thing was like, is that it? Mm. Like I came out of surgery and I'm like, so I get to live like oh. this. And the doctor's like, okay, we're done. Oh. Like, you can go home soon. I'm like, really? Like, I can't. Oh. And, it, and it's interesting because your brain then becomes completely full of that. So like 95% of your brain is just trying to manage how can you breathe through this? Mm. How can you manage this pain? Yeah, literally breathing. Just trying to work out how to recalibrate my breathing and mm. not and not give up kind of thing where you're like, really, this is it? I gotta like breathe like this for the next three days or whatever, because the pain's so insane, I can't even register. And then people are trying to have conversations with you asking whether you've taken your medication and you're like, I have no idea, dude. Like I'm just, <laughs> I'm struggling just to be here right now, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of that of just really, and unless you've been in it, you, cause people are like, oh, how bad is it? And you're like, you can't even fathom it. Mm. There's nothing that, comes even close and people are like, oh, I had sciatica and like, oh, that was terrible. And you're like, mate, it doesn't even touch, mm. you know, what it is. And, and the crazy thing is it's invisible, right? And people are like, you look fine. Mm. And you're like, no, nah, it's just kind of, it's, and then we were trying a bunch of acupuncture to try and get it to, you know, get the, pe but nothing comes even close, you know? Mm. Um, and then the craziest thing is it's, it's your own body, right? So it's, it's all within you. So you're fighting this battle with your, it's one thing to have an external argument with someone, but to have an internal battle with your body that's, I mean, I've been lucky enough to have a body that's very athletic and I could basically do and balance on things and do whatever I wanted to do and be pretty proficient at it to then going to this state of, I can't even manage just lying here kind of thing, mm. you know? Um, so it was, it was, um, yeah, it was trying to adjust to that, you know, and then also, man, I, I think the hardest part is the guilt of mm. other people, of what you're putting. So like my girlfriend and like my, my son and like even my, you know, my business partners and just the guilt of putting them through that, of like seeing their faces and being like, oh, shit, this is really bad because they're here. Mm. And then I could see it on their faces with a, oh, this mm. is a bad one. Like it's kind of... You know, because they'd come to the hospital, I'd have a broken my arm or something, oh, here we go, you know, sort of thing. But this one I could really see on people's faces that I was like, oh, this is serious. Um, and so it's trying to deal with that and not take it too personally kind of thing or not try to th 
think how you've sort of messed with other people's lives to us and and that's something i'm very glad of too of like i'm just so happy it was me just me and i didn't injure anybody else mm. nobody else was involved because i don't know how i could ever live with Injuring doing any of this to somebody else you know like that would be the word the worst thing that could ever happen i think but um mm. yeah the, it, so there's so many things you don't think of right that become really prominent in your mind so um man now you're taking me back to all the because I, I it's funny i it's i'm like one of those people that likes to just move forward oh, and yeah. try and move and you obviously have to deal with things at certain points in time and this is obviously helpful for that but it, it's yeah it's it's hard to go back there because it was like it, you don't know the way out like in most things you're like oh this will be three months and i do pt and but this was like, how do I get out of this? And then seeing other people like in the ward, they're all in wheelchairs and you're like, oh man, is this it? Is this like, mm. is this me for the rest of my life? Do I just get to sit in the bed and be on catheters and meds and mm. watch daytime TV all day or whatever it is? It's like, so that in itself was like a big yeah, shock of like of trying to adjust to, to that. Um, you shared with me that you became disabled, but not disabled enough. <laughs> right. Can you tell us what you meant and explain the disability? And then, yeah, so that there was a point where there was an evaluation. They gave me a walker um, and they're like, hey, walk around the ward. Um, and I did, um, but I really pushed, you know, like it was insane amount of pain, but I was like, you know what? I just like, I'm one of those people that just likes to keep pushing, pushing, pushing. Mm. And I did it and then they told me like, okay, you're, you're overqualified now for in-house rehab. Um, so you're now gonna be external rehab. And I was like, what? How does that work? Um, and so that, yeah, it, it... So explain that to us a little bit. What's internal rehab I mean, internal external? rehab, like you, you end up being in the hospital, there's kind of a gym next door kind of thing. There's people there all the time. You go there every morning, you do the rehab, you do the routines. I mean, you go home, you go home, and then someone comes and visits you and does a daily, not a daily, but maybe twice a week they'll come. And it, it just, you know, for your mental state, at least if you do internal, there's other people, there's people that are going through the same thing and you can kind of have a relation, you know what I mean? Like at least there's some kind of motivation. So I find that to be insanely difficult because I end up having to go back to my home, which has stairs in it which has stairs going up to the front door, back door, um, and trying to get my head around being in that space again. When I'd left the space, I'd gone for a drive in my car, mm. right? And I was doing a bunch of things and ready to go on a trip. We were gonna go to Hawaii or something like the following week. So we were getting ready for the trip. And, and so it was trying to get the mental state of getting back into that, um, or getting into that routine or creating a routine or creating something because there was no one to bounce off. It was just me in a room. Uh, you know, my girlfriend at the time was working. Everyone was still working. I, I don't have any family here. Um, you know, like parents or anything like that. So it was kind of like, yeah, that was a big, like, oh shit, what do I do now kind of thing? How mm. do I get myself out of this sort of thing? Um, so I don't know whether I deviated from your question. No, bit, yeah. But, but it's um, interesting because I'd never heard that. I'd never heard that there's a, Oh, I didn't know there was such a thing you either. Know, I wish I just not. I wish I hadn't thing. moved, you know. Um, yeah, because there's other people that are fully paralyzed or quadriplegic or whatever it might be. Um, mm. So I mean, obviously they they need it more than than I did. So, but it was just hard mentally to go back to my own space and then have to piece, no kind of piece my piece life together yeah. almost, you know, and, and do that and even try to get to the bathroom on my own, which was in itself. Mm insanely difficult yeah. right um and thank goodness for like uber eats right and all that stuff started when uh when that happened so i could order food and i mean obviously friends bought things and mm. came and but um yeah it's um man, i wouldn't wish that on my mm. worst enemy not that i have a worst enemy but you know mm. i wouldn't wish that on anybody it was the first two years truly truly hardcore like mm. nothing I hope no one ever has to experience that. It, it, it was just dark, like mm. trying to trying to get through that. Um, mm. Yeah, <sighs> yeah, it was. Um, 
and the meds and then having to do all the meds and mm. that just trying to stay and then that was the thing trying to stay yourself you know mm. once the medication's kicking in and you need it for the pain but then you want to try and stay relatively normal and it took me to another i feel like i lived in another dimension for a while mm. um i was literally not being able to do anything you know um and just having to lay there and and then actually what some of the most helpful things were people bringing their dogs mm. and it was like just having people's dogs come and visit and mm. and the dogs would instinctively know that there was something wrong with me oh. and would just be chill and be like oh, i'm just gonna lay here with you yeah. and it was it was very sweet to kind of see that sort of empathy come from from animals you know yeah, that's um, so what was your disability um Partial, partially paralyzed. I mean, I don't know how to categorize it. Um, I would say probably 60% of my body didn't work from my belly button down. Um, my feet, I could wiggle some of my toes on my right foot, but no function on my left foot. Um, yeah, I basically lost all, all muscle mass below the injury mm. uh, and all the nerves basically from the accident I basically landed on my bum so hard that I crushed my, um, my nerves. Um, and they have a myelin sheath that goes around them and I'd crushed all of them. Luckily I hadn't severed them because I found out subsequently, like if you sever your, your nerves, where the, 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 the actual scar tissue is, your nerves cannot regenerate from mm. around there. Which is why a lot of people, when they have these kind of injuries, they have these elements of scar tissue where the, the body's trying to regrow so it's always firing so that's why they're always in pain because oh. this scar tissue won't allow it to grow any further oh. um so luckily for me i got i was a i didn't sever my, my 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 nerves so i get to regrow them again um so it's been nearly 60 months it's an inch a month a millimeter a day oh. um it grows completely symmetrically this is interesting because a lot of people are like, well, you can walk. I'm like, yeah, but I couldn't feel my feet or control my feet. Oh. Um, so it's kind of random. Oh. And at the same time, part of this as well is there's the regrowth, but then there's also like, I know that I have to keep my body in a certain symmetry mm. or otherwise I'm going to damage my knees. I'm going to damage my ankles. Oh. So I've been really focused on, and luckily I come from the footwear world. So I've you know, been yeah. analyzing footwear yeah. Braces, talking to so many people about braces, stirrups, PT tape, and always try to keep my body in real symmetry. So, mm. so I can ride a bicycle. So cycling was good because I'd always keep everything and swimming as well. So keep everything in this motion and try not to make anything go like mm. too, you know, too wayward or anything like that. Um, and really try to look after everything so that when I do recover that I can, I don't have a blown out knee I don't have a blown out ankle. Um, and my PT has been insanely, like I have a PT who's a neuro rehab specialist, oh. um, who in fact, I was gonna do another project with, um, mm. and she and we'd met like two weeks earlier to start this project. And she called me all mad, like, you know, what's wrong with you? Why, why haven't you emailed me back about this project? Like, why aren't we starting this? Uh, and I'm like, like oh, starting, and I'm like, well, different. I'm in hospital and like blah, blah, blah. And she came to visit me in hospital. And, and I know her as a physical trainer from the mm -hmm. gym I used to go to. And, uh, and she's like, oh, she turns up and she's like, okay, so do you know what I really do? And I'm like, no. And she's like, well, I'm, uh, I'm going to get choked up. There. Hold on. She's like, I'm a neuro rehab specialist. And I've been working with like, she used to work in Barcelona in this hospital and work with like people that had, had crazy car accidents, were basically paralyzed. Um, and she's like, basically what's happened to you is exactly what I specialize in. Oh. And so I've been seeing her ever since. Mm. Um, she worked on me for a year for like no fee and um, has truly helped bring me back to life, you know, um, amongst other people too. Um, sorry. Yeah, I didn't realize I was going to get... <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I, I have a trainer friend that's been training me too. And like, we took a year off. And then once he knew that I could go and do stuff, he would basically drag me to the gym. We'd put on all these 
apparatus and try and work out how on earth we were going to try and get me fit again, you know? Um, and so, I've, yeah, I've been super lucky in that way where I've had a team of people around me that have really, really helped me to, to come back. And, and then, yeah, the, the Rolfing guy that I see, I mean, I, um, I've been seeing him for a long time. He came and worked on me um, and basically told me the, the second week that I was out of hospital, he came and he's like, look, we have to give it a little bit of time. He's like, your body's completely switched off. We have to find a way to turn it back on. Mm. He's like, this is gonna hurt a lot and you're gonna be in pain for about a week. But I'm, I have to turn your body back on because this is the only way you're gonna recover. Otherwise, we're gonna wait for months and it might not happen. Um, so he does, I don't know what he does, but he puts his hands behind my back and he does a lot of cranial work too. And it always feels like he's playing the piano on my spine, right? And I'm like, Harvey, are you moving your fingers? He's like, no, that's just the energy. That's just the energy. We're gonna get you move. And what? exactly what he said happened. Like for a full week, it was unbelievable amounts of pain. But I could feel like my core energy, you know, like when you, I don't know, I don't know whether people have it, but I kind of sometimes talk to my body and I'm like, all right, what, what, what's going on here? But I really felt the energy mm -hmm. come back where I'm like, and I, I still have it with him. I see him monthly and I'm like, yo, Harvey, we're nearly there. Like you did this, you did this. You got the energy going here, here, here. And he'll ask me like, where do you need the energy? I'm like, right here, like, just mm. get me right here. Like, let's work on it. And, um, and to be honest, that has been part of it too. Just his, his body work has really helped, you mm. know. And along with, you know, I've worked really hard on training and so it's been a culmination of everyone's efforts, you know, over the past sort of four and a half years to try and get me back to sort of walking and back to, doing things again, you know? Mm. Um, but, um, sorry, back to your question. What was your initial? <laughs> I, I always go off on a tangent. I'm sorry. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm terrible at it. I'm like, I talk good. around the question, you right? To you totally <laughs> answered the question. Okay. Don't worry about okay. it. Um, so not only was your life filled with a lot of adventure and travel and you were just always on to your next thing, right. hopping around the world um, before the accident, but you were also at the peak of your physical strength. What was it like to lay in bed for a year and a half straight at the beginning of your recovery for someone whose identity is, was wrapped in their physical right. strength? Right, It wasn't quite, it was, I mean, I was in bed for a year and a half, but the real bad bit was probably three to six months of okay. being kind of bedridden. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I feel lucky that so there's other people that I've met, like other athletes that I've met that have crashed doing really crazy things. And there's one guy who's a professional mountain biker and and I know he can't walk properly, mm. but he has enough apparatus on him that he makes it look like he can walk in. And he's back riding his bike again and wow. stuff like that. And I just feel very lucky that I I love doing those sports and I love doing the you know, the all the outdoor stuff and whatever it might be, but for me, my career is in design, right? And creating, and I just feel very lucky that I had that place to go to, you mm. know, where I could always go to my head and, you know, from all the long flights of flying to Australia as a kid back in the, the 80s when it took 30 hours, I'd learned discipline and I'd learned how to basically do things in my head, you know, mm. and daydream and work things out. And, and I mean, I used to ride the bike trails in Whistler in my head, in my bed, you know, I'd like go through the trails in my head and mm. just try and do it that way, you know, but really I feel very lucky that I have a creative side to me where I just turn to drawing and I turn to actually starting a new business. Mm. So, um, and then just applying all my creativity to, 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 to solving the problem and finding another way out and being literally because I think, you know, we use, our, we use our minds to control our body and then sometimes we need our body to control our minds, right? And I basically got put in a place where I had neither tool and mm -hmm. I had to work out in my mind how to take all this craziness out of the loop and focus it somewhere in a positive manner mm. um, of something that was moving forward. I realized I couldn't, physically I was in a stagnated state but then I realized with social media and the way we have technology now, I'm, I'm lucky I got a, you know, if I'd done this 10 years earlier, I would have been reading a newspaper and a couple of magazines, but now I've got everything in my hand. And I was mm. like, well, I'm gonna be on the internet this much. I might as well start a business. And my friend and I had talked about starting something. And so we started it, you know, and it, 
really kept my mind busy where I was like, if I stay busy in this creative role, but still do the physical side, I can slowly edge my way out of this, you know? Um, so yeah, there was, a, there was a few years of physical stagnation where I really had to just switch brains and mm. go to move away from the action and kind of go to simpler things. Mm. Um, Hmm. Um, what was the emotional journey of getting disconnected from the physical body and having to rebuild that? Insanely difficult. Um, it's weird. It, 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 it's almost like trying to come to terms with it, you know? Like the way I thought about it was like, because because when I did stuff, I would go hard and I would, like when I'd ride bikes up at Whistler or whatever, I would ride from when the lift opened to when the lift closed. Like I was that guy, you know, mm. or even snowboarding. It's like, is, there, is the lift still open? Let's go, you know, <laughs> even, and and I feel like I almost knew or something, something crazy was going, I didn't, not, oh. maybe subconsciously, I was like, if I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it, all of it, mm. and get it really hard and go as best as I can with all of it. And I feel like I sort of reasoned with myself. I'm like, look, I was at my physical peak, I did all the things I wanted to do. I went all the beautiful places I wanted to go. I did all these physical things. Maybe this is life just telling me, you got to use your brain now and mm. really focus on what you're good at, you know, in your mind and creative, you know, creative wise and focus on that. Um, your physical abilities helped you f to feel alive and right. they helped you to feel, Right. I mean, you know, going back to boarding school and feeling kind of a little bit trapped and then right. feeling free, right, right, feeling right. alive yeah, and all that like vitality, and right, right, you know, right. and then going back to being disconnected from that. Right. What's the emotional journey of rebuilding that and trying to feel vital in your body again? Right. It was like a reprioritization of everything in my mind mm. and kind of taking the physical stuff and sort of putting it to one side. Mm. Um, but then also applying the same, so I'm not like a gym person or I haven't been. And it was only since I worked at Nike that I was like, oh, I should probably go to the gym. <laughs> and then I was like, all right, I, I'll get fit. And I actually went, did, I don't want to go off on another tangent, <laughs> but like it was, um, and then I learned from that, from the from the actual regime of fitness, of like then to apply it back to my body and just, it was this going back to this whole yes or no thing of like just doing these tiny baby steps of like, okay, maybe it's not moving my leg today. Maybe it's not moving that toe, but I can move my calf muscle. I can move my kneecap. Mm. And it would be that. And it would be just finding some kind of, um, yeah, just knowing that I was moving in the right direction, mm. you know? and just having it, almost having it on simmer. Like mm. I'd been on high heat mm -hmm. for a long time and I was like, all right, this is gonna be it. And it was funny because, well, not funny, but I'd always wondered about rehab. I was like, why do people have to go to rehab? Mm. How does that work? Because I'd always been very lucky with how my body usually recovered from things. And then I truly understood and I was like, wow, this is a really, really slow race. Mm. And then also at boarding school, I used to run cross country. So my brother was a great runner and somehow I got roped into it and they thought I was good. But I don't think I had the physical attributes of my brother, but I worked out and I used to run long distance, mostly 1,500, 3,000. I worked out it was a mind game mm. and it wasn't to do with my physical ability. It was to do with like, do I think I can do it? Mm. Can I win this race? And I worked out I could make my body do whatever I wanted, like as long as I, my head was in it. And it was almost like I applied that same running sort of ethos to my recovery of like, as long as I know I'm going in the right direction, it's gonna be a long, long race, but I just gotta stay in it and apply that same mm. logic of like, I know I can win it. Because from the beginning, I always said to myself, 100% recovery, no questions. And people are like, well, you can't get it. And I'm like, I'm not listening to you. Like, this is what I've set as the goal. And I'm like, and I'm just gonna take these baby steps every single day mm, and apply that. it to, to that. and. And it's like anything, right? You apply yourself to things, you become an expert at it. So I became like an expert at recovery. Hmm. Um, what does it feel like to move through the world with an invisible disability? Um, insanely difficult because most people, you know, and even pre-accident, you're, you're, you know, you're going out to do what you do in the day and you're like, hey, I'm gonna drop the kids here, go here, do that. I gotta go chop pop in there. Um, and I'm just working out how to get to the door, 
Mm. Right. And that's literally why I have to try and explain to my, my girlfriend where I'm like, it, 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 I can't even get to the door mm. today sort of thing. Um, it, 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 and it changes from day to day because the, the pain changes because the, the nerves are growing every day. So I'll wake up with a different ailment or a different pain and you're like, oh man, I got to deal with this today. Um, but yeah, no, you know what? It's given me a completely different insight into, I don't know whether it's America, but just dealing with being disabled in America is pretty tough. Mm. And like I said before, I carry a stick when I travel, just not for walking, but just to be like, yo, there's something up with me. Mm. You might want to give me a berth, you know, some mm. room. Um, and it gives me an enormous amount of empathy for disabled people that I see. Um, and I try and help people as much as I possibly can, you know? Mm. Um, and anytime I go to a party now, I see someone in a wheelchair, they're the first person I talk to, right? Mm. Um, and I just try and make jokes about it with, with other people that I see are disabled. Um, I see a lot of disability and a lot of people hide it. Um, I'm now a professional at seeing people's gates of their walks mm. and I'm like, oh, that guy's hips out or his back's out or her back's out. And, mm. and it's amazing the amount of damaged people that are walking around and I wouldn't like to know how many people are at home that don't even come outside, you know? Um, it's not an easy thing to do. Like, I feel like I should have a sticker on my, you know, on my shirt or something that says I'm disabled. I mean, even disabled parking spots, right? I go get the spot outside the bank that I know like I can walk from here to there. And then you see someone get the spot and there's nothing really wrong with them. Or you see people parking in disabled spots that shouldn't be there. And you're like, yo, dude, I can't even get from here to there. Mm. And when you tell people they get all mad at you, it's weird. I've had some very strange mm -hmm. interactions. And I mean, even parking in disabled bay when I had my son and I went to buy him a toy and I didn't have the badge in the window and the, 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 the traffic guy saw me walking, saw I couldn't walk, gives me a ticket oh. for parking in a disabled spot. And I'm like, yeah, dude, it's in the glove box. And I show him and it's out of date. And he's like, yeah, no, you have to go to court. And I'm like, you can see, oh, I've got man. my kid here. Oh. And the guy's like, I'm not talking to you. And gets in his car, shuts oh. the window, rolls the windows up. And I'm like, really? Like, it's like that? And I don't think people, I mean, I can't even, yeah. it's so far to walk at, the hospital I go to, to even go to the appointment to get my disabled badge, I still don't have one, mm. like a proper one. Um, just cause I, I can't get there. I mean, unless I, and I don't want to give into the wheelchair. That's always been the mm. thing too, where I'm like, I, I think mentally, as soon as I give into the wheelchair, then I've lo I'm losing half the battle where I've always been very adamant about like, I'll stay in bed for a day if I have to, I'm not getting in the chair. I'm going to walk it, I'm going to do it. And I've kind of gone from having a walker, the tennis balls to walker with wheels. Then I had my hip hop names, two canes, because I had two canes for a while, which is kind of cool. And then I went to one cane and then now I just hold on to one cane because it, you know, to tell people that I'm, um, but yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. And it's almost like you have to be in a wheelchair or I have to be missing an arm or something mm. for people to really recognize there's something wrong. Um, and I don't like to, you know, as a guy, you don't, as, as a man, you don't really like to tell people like, Hey, I'm disabled. I need some help kind of thing. Mm. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of difficult sometimes, you know? Um, and then I think the other thing too, is like, I, people were like, well, you look fine and you dress better than most people. <laughs> and I think that's been a problem too. It's like, I dressing well, like if I wore a coat and a shirt or something, you know, people are like, you, you look fine. Mm. And it's almost like, well, what do I have to do? Like dress like I'm disabled. Like how, how does mm. this work? Mm. Um, so it's been a, it's, I feel for people a lot. Mm. Like people that are stuck in this state, I have enormous amounts of empathy for. And it's tough just to get out of the house, you know? Um, it's tough to drive down the street. And then you get the stress levels of having a nervous system that's been completely affected by, so stress of like road rage or anyone mm. cutting you off, it's like you, you kind of have to peace out a little bit. Or like someone else drive, I can't <laughs> handle this kind of stress, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's another thing people don't talk about is the managing your nervous system. Um, because my nervous system's insanely flared up because it's trying to deal with like, mm. oh, we're repairing, we're repairing 
we can't deal with this mm. this argument or this whatever's mm. going on here right now. So it's it's hard to keep your temper at a certain like I literally have to put my hand out with my girlfriend. I'm like just just walk away. Like just please, I mm. I need the space because I, I'm trying to manage you know this insanity going on in mm. my body. So I think as far as the emotional side of it, I was lucky enough to have a friend who's um, he's been partially paralyzed for about 30 years. He fell in a rock climbing accident. Um, and we were lucky enough to sh be able to share experiences where he's been doing it on his own for 30 years. And he was almost, I mean, he just feels so lucky to have someone that mm -hmm. actually understands what he's, what he's going through. Um, Cause it's not like I can tell my family members every day that I'm going through insane amounts of pain or people in my office or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. Um, so it's nice to have this, one person in my life that I can actually, we can just be brutally honest about everything that we do in our lives. And he always gives me recommendations of take this supplement, try this, we'll do mm. some magnesium with this or whatever it might be. And he also does swimming with like disabled kids. Um, mm. So I've been out with him doing swimming with him. And um, yeah, it's been a great, great way to try and try and sort of navigate this or work it out as far as from an emotional point of view. I'm sure that helps with maybe the loneliness. Right, and then that's something he talks about a lot, where he's like, Yo, dude, I've been like mm. on my own for 30 years, you know, and no one really, I mean, he obviously has his family and he has his friends, but it's, no one really gets it. No one really mm. gets what he goes through on a daily basis, what he has to do to get his body to a certain state, just to even leave the house, you know, mm. even to get dressed. I mean, it's, um, it, it's a whole different, yeah, I, I, you can't really explain it to people. It's like, it's a different, we live in a different an alternative reality almost. You can't express what's going on to anyone. Like no one will ever understand because mm -hmm. they don't, or no one, not no one, but majority of people will never understand or hopefully never have to experience anything like this in their life. So it's kind of, and you see the world just rushing by you, right? And you're stagnant and you're not moving and it, and it becomes like a, again, it's like one of those things, it's a mental shift of having to realign your brain and be like, this is, just temporary, this is for now, this is what you got to focus on. You can't ignore the noise and just, mm. just focus. Mm. Um, it's kind of what it's really helped me mm. or what I've, I think fan is a way out or a way through it, you know? It's almost like you, you become, got to become like a, a, a mental strategist and work out how to navigate through these things, like just everyday stuff, you know? That's in, yeah, it's, uh, you briefly compared where you are now with boarding school. How is it similar or right. different? I think it's being trapped in a certain environment. Uh, yeah, I feel like I've gone back in time almost and I'm back at school again, mm. where I'm trapped in an environment and I just have to hold true in that environment and just sustain myself and get through it kind of thing. So it's almost like kind of how I sort of bit my lip at school maybe and I'm like, all right, I just got to get through this. It's the same thing now where I'm, and also from a creative standpoint, it's quite interesting. It's given me um, time alone, away from all the noise of the world, mm. to actually think of better ways of doing things or different ways of thinking and not being influenced by other people's opinions and doing something that's very, which I had as a teenager where I felt like getting out of school and then living in London, I felt like I got to be creative and I got to be my creative self. And I feel much the same now where I've kind of embraced the creativity mm. of myself again and trying to make that the engagement point and mm. use that to, 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 to take me out of this. Um, um, you, you told your seven-year-old um, that you've been living your worst nightmare. All right. And you told me this time has been you battling yourself and that you've had suicidal thoughts on the daily. Right. What has helped you keep going? I think it, it's, I think we all have it, right? I, I see it as like this carousel in my head that just kind of goes around. And obviously in the beginning there was, there was thoughts of like, I should just end this. Like I've had a really good life so far. It's been pretty fun. I should probably just check out. Mm -hmm. And um, just cause dealing with the pain on the daily basis was insane, right? Mm -hmm. And, but then the other tough part of it was like, well, I'm paralyzed, so I can't even do anything to myself. <laughs> um, so I'm kind of stuck here. Um, I had to say it's insanely tough to, to manage it because it, it's some, it's a reoccurring thing and 
And actually, my, my, my mother actually took her own life. Um, she had, um, before she died, about 15 years before she died, she had actually spinal surgery and they botched the spinal surgery and left her nerves, now I've learned, left her nerves severed. Mm. So she had problems with walking and nerve pain and, and we never understood it as a family. And so I'm just, it's almost like life reflecting back on me, like, or my mom being like, yo, this is what happened to me for 15 years. Mm. And that's kind of why I pieced out. Um, and I think my children, you know, my children are kind of what mm. drive me, you know? Um, and just to, hold on, one sec. Just to show them what it's like to come back, you know? And just kind of, just show them what a comeback looks like is really what my goal was. And it's working, so. Yeah, sorry. It just gets a bit much sometimes, you know. And then just, yeah, just trying to be the best possible dad that I can be, you know, to him. So, yeah, I think really my children are the motivators, you know, to just try and really show them and guide them and show them what it looks like to just never give up. Mm. And, and it's cute because I've kind of installed it in my oldest where he's, he's like, never give up, daddy, you know. <laughs> we'll go ride bikes and get stuck somewhere. He's like, never give up, daddy, and we just, we do it. And so I think that's been a real driver, you know, just to show them how to be strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Um. I know you mentioned to me that your mom, before her, before getting her nerve pain, was very joyous and bubbly. Oh yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Um, she was like the life of the party. Do you feel that this experience has just gotten you closer to her, closer to understanding her? Totally, I think it's, it's helped an enormous amount where I never really, I mean, I never, she, she always told me like whenever I'd see her, like she's like, I, I'm probably not going to be here next time you come back because I had to go visit her in London, and uh, and then one time she, you know, she she did it. She did what she said she was going to mm. do, and I think I struggled with it a bit just because I I never I never got to really talk to her before she went, you know, and that kind of really hurt me a lot. But now this is kind of like my closure of like, okay, or my mum just being like, yeah, just being like, that's what it was. That's what I had. Um, and yeah, I just feel for her having, cause we, we just didn't know, you know, we tried so many things to help her and there really wasn't an answer. Mm. I mean, she was left with a, a live wire in her back kind of thing, you know, mm. and her feet. So, um, yeah, no, it, it definitely makes me feel closer, you know, um, and just a huge amount of empathy, um, of what she went through and how she carried on doing it without, you know, she carried on her life and still did what she did and just was a bit more moody than usual. So, so I think, yeah, overall the injury like got me a lot closer to her and uh, so I had a better understanding of kind of what she went through and really why in the end, yeah, she took her own life. Um, and yeah, I, I get it, I get it, so. Mm. You're about five, six months away, maybe, from being able to walk without any major issues. Hopefully, if you're. I last, hope so. I, I think so. If, yeah, if like my calculations are correct. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Because um, it comes to the the big toes come last. Hmm. So I want my toes. I don't have dorsiflexion here, but I have feeling, and I mean, it's only in the past six months I got feeling in my left foot. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. It's just a new experience of how it's, I've never gone through this before. So yeah. it's like. Um, so w where are you at with your mental health? My mental health? Um, in a pretty good place. Mm. I've got it. I think I, I've, I think this injury has taught me to be insanely headstrong. Um, and I feel invincible to be honest, mm. mentally. I mean, physically, I'm obviously a bit of a train wreck, but um, Mentally, 
the strongest I've ever been. Because mm. I think this has just helped me build up this resilience, this resilience, and but at the same time, insanely empathetic. So it's been this really nice balance of both, you know. Um, and being strong doesn't mean you can't be empathetic, doesn't mean you can't mm. cry. I think it just, it's just having a really strong head now where I, I, I feel like I can do anything mm. um, and overcome anything um, as long as my mind's, and I'm so grateful that I didn't hit my head any mm. harder and didn't damage my brain and- um, Of course. And yeah, just, just very headstrong, very headstrong. Mm. Um, your partner is a therapist. Right. How has this life event influenced your relationship? I think it's made our relationship a lot stronger. Um, and then also, I think she uses me like a case study too, because <laughs> she has other she has other patients that are that have nerve damage. She has another um, coworker that has the same kind of thing too, mm. through di for for different reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, it's made us stronger, and I think just a deeper understanding of everything. And I mean, we've been, I mean, I'm not going to say hell, but we've been to mm. crazy and back uh, like three times kind of thing, you know? Mm. Um, it's made us truly communicate on a completely different level, um, like beyond what I'd done in recent, you know, in other relationships. Um, and yeah, get us both in a very headstrong place and we can talk about everything and anything. Um, I mean, she's seen me at my worst, at mm. my weakest, and um, and even through her network of friends too. Like from the beginning, have been unbelievably helpful. Where I'm, I'm a little bit sort of stubborn, and I had some of her friends who are therapists help me with um, meditations, help me with just healing sort of things. Chant as crazy as it sounds, like chanting mm. or music. And throughout my recovery, they've they've sent me numerous things, and and likewise, it's gone back and forth mm. where I've learned things, and I'm like, hey, maybe you guys can try this in the mm. in the clinic, or if someone's Beautiful. acting like that, it's like it's because they're in an insane amount of pain, so mm. I don't expect a, an answer out of you know, and yeah, it's helped us sort of navigate things that we wouldn't normally have to do in a normal relationship. So yeah, it's made us stronger, like way stronger, I think. So. Oh, she might amazing. tell you different. <laughs> <laughs> um, you had your second son in March of 2020. Right. You mentioned it's been humbling to learn to walk alongside your son. Right. Can you tell us about that? Well, I think he actually beat me. Like, he's way ahead. Like, he runs circles around me right now. But it, it's talking about the mental side of it. It's working out how to not go to that place of like, oh man, I wish I could go and do this. Oh, I wish I could go walk in the park or I wish I could throw a ball with him or really want to learn how to do it. It's more like, what can we do together? Mm. And I think in turn, it's helped me just go to the smallest, smallest thing in the room and, 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 and do that with my child, you know, do that with my son where I'm like, we can do little things. It doesn't have to involve running around or sports mm. or whatever traditionally you might be taught it, it, it's doing the smallest things of I can lay here right now and hang out with you and talk to you and cuddle you and and that's good enough kind of thing um and it's really taking yeah it's really like I said with the school thing it's taken me back to literally being a child again where I've got to relearn all these things mentally I know it all but physically I've got to mm. and so it's kind of sharing those things with him as he's crawling and I'm crawling and and then slowly he's walking and yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, I almost think it's a good thing mm. because I feel like now parents are always trying to get their kids to do things at the young, take their kids to the skate park when they're three. So they can be the professional at 16 or whatever. Mm. And, it, and it's almost, and in my head, I was a little bit like that where I was like, oh, I'm going to get the kids doing this and this. And it's almost been a great thing to flip the other way and be like, you know what? I've just been doing nothing with them and just mm. been at peace and we draw pictures and eat and just spend really close time together, you know, and I'm not going anywhere. And, you know, if I hadn't had the accident, I probably would have been off working or doing something else. And I've spent as much as possible time, you know, time as possible with my, with my, with my youngest son, because he's there and we're there and it, yeah, mm. it's been a, 
an amazing experience where it just takes you down to the simplest, simplest things, you know. Um, and you, you realise you don't need all this stuff. And mm -hmm. You don't need money, you don't need a big house and a... You know, it's, oh, yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. nice. It's yeah. really nice. I mean, and I think children do that in general, right? Mm -hmm. It just takes it down to I mean, we didn't grow up with things. all the stuff. Right, <laughs> right, right. I feel like the slowing down um, enables more connection. Right. Exactly, yeah. And mm -hmm. takes you away from the... Instead going of to shuttling the, going to the a mall places. and going to have ice cream and doing all the things you're, you know, stereotypically you're sort of told to do and play dates and you're like, nah, we're just going to mess around in the garden. And yeah, it's, yeah, it's been great. It's mm. been great. And then as a motivator too, you know, just to have a little person to motivate you every day that yeah. wakes you up at 5 a.m. <laughs> right. And, all right. Here we go. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, or a person whose identity was so wrapped in going fast and you've right. had to slow down so much. Right. Um, are you comfortable going slow now? I didn't have a choice, right? Hmm. Well, I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where I just feel very lucky that I don't didn't do that for a living, mm. and that wasn't my identity, right? Um, I mean, f first off, I can't go any faster, right? I'm mm. kind of stuck where I am. Also, you haven't seen me driving, so that's <laughs> a, <laughs> so I'm not sure about whether right. But I, I think you You're just probably you, still going just as fast uh, as before. I, I, no, no comment. Um, <laughs> So it, it's, I mean, I think it's like anything in life. It's, it, I think the true intelligence is being able to adapt, right? And it's just ad adaptation. Mm -hmm. And whatever conflict or whatever problem comes in your way, just working out how to adapt and evolve around it mm -hmm. is kind of what I've really focused on. And just trying to evolve based on what's going on with me. Like, okay, I can do this and this. We'll keep it chill and we'll keep it. So I'm kind of within the confines of my injury and I'll probably get back to doing some silly things again. Maybe not as crazy, but yeah. And, and maybe my age too. It's like, you know, I'm nearly 50, so I should probably, society tells me I should probably chill out too. So <laughs> um, yeah, it's more just trying to adjust to it. You know, it's making the adjustments and, and in my brain, I still want to get back to, to where I was. Um, and I'm sure I will in certain things, but. Um, yeah, it's just being good with it, you know, and mm -hmm. letting it just, just, I mean, now that I have two children, it, I, I don't, things are great. Mm -hmm. I don't really need, I don't you're, really need it anymore. I don't need the fix so you're, much you're as get, I used to. You're getting, you're getting it in other ways. Right. You're my, getting, my bikes and cars things used to be like my therapy, right? I would go out and that's where I'd get my calm time in nature and peacefulness and then go back to the the hecticness of business and stuff and traveling and um so i think no it, it like i said it's like my mum just mm. wherever she is being like i told you you should be doing this it's like right it's like a, i don't know that's the way i think about it um and try not to take it too seriously mm. is really what i i mean try and find a laugh in it is where i where i'm at too so because it's easy to be upset about it but there's no there's no point yeah. There's no point, so. Do you feel your kids have kind of been a, a way to reparent yourself in, in some way? Yeah, respects? yeah, right, right. They're, yeah, it's like guardrails, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because now I'm like really, you're, you're I'm like, do slow down, slow down, slow down. <laughs> it's like, what are we not using here? The brakes, use the brakes, <laughs> right? It's like, a, yeah, a little bit. Like now I'm, well, because I can't really, everything has to be verbal because I can't chase them anymore. And they know that and they'll just leg it off into the park. And so, yeah, it's made me very aware of like, I think before I, I didn't really realize how dangerous things were, right? <laughs> I, d I never really thought about it. I never really, when people are like, oh, you're running that motorbike again? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Until it's not fine, right? Um, but yeah my, yeah, my kids have been super helpful in all of it. I mean, I, I think it's all part of growing up, right? Maybe I'm now an adult, I don't know, mm. maybe. But also I feel like maybe you're giving to your kids this whole slowdown and giving to your kids the connection right. that you're giving them is maybe something that you also right. craved when you were younger. In I think you're, you're right, you're right. Yeah, that's a good observation. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's giving them, and then you read about it and it's like the first three years are completely, you know, if you nurture your child in three, the first three years, that's kind of like gold, mm. right? 
and I yeah I truly believe I've been able to do that especially with my second son it's like mm. it's been yeah almost like a blessing in disguise right mm. it's and and even my girlfriend says it where she's like you know what if you didn't have the accident we probably wouldn't be together you probably would have gone off yeah <laughs> you would have gone and done something <laughs> instead right so yeah it's life comes at you in different ways right and it's just about how you take it and how you process it I think um Mm. And try not to get too bummed out by things um, and see the bright side of it. Yeah. So it's been, yeah, it's just been learning a lot of, I mean, the, my, I could do without the pain, but mm. the learning experience has definitely been truly helpful. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make me a broader, more understanding person, you know, with a bigger visibility to so many more things that I never, never, ever would have ever seen, you know. Mm. Um, especially in the world of people with disabilities and people less fortunate than ourselves. It's, it's really given me a big window into that world, which I think is amazing. It's, yeah, it's great. It's beautiful. It's, uh, um, you just briefly mentioned chanting and meditation. And I want to ask you, what alternative healing modalities did you experiment right. with through this journey? Um, anything that's had a profound effect on you? Is there a modality that you'd encourage others to try with chronic pain? So, right. you know, just digging into that. I found moving is basically it. As much pain as it is, moving has really been the key of, because I found there's a point of, like, if you move enough, you can get your, your adrenaline going. And then also with children too, sorry, mm. it's bringing everything together. But the, so then I end up focusing on the children doing something physical and then the ailments, I try and block out the physicality of it and just push through it. Um, and I found like that, that's been really helpful to just get your body to move no matter what it is. I mean, I do probably three to five hours of body work a day of mm -hmm. between stretching, rolling, you know, yoga, mm -hmm. just trying to get everything loose so I can go to bed and then do it the next day. <laughs> but as that happens, the windows close, right? In the beginning, it was like, maybe six days of nothing and the seventh day I might do something. And then slowly it's been like more more. five days, two days, right? And then it's slowly, and then now I can do things four days a week. And I try to acupuncture, but we worked out in the beginning, I feel like that's more like the icing on the cake at the end. Once you've mm. made the cake, then that's the icing to finish, finish everything and make sure everything's functioning properly and the blood flow's all going. Um, in the beginning, it was a lot of like, I worked out my voice or humming hmm. could help raise vibration. or help the vibrations could help my, like the nerves, the, the nerves and hmm. also my, um, just the, the, the pain in my spine, you know, and then hmm. also the, um, it, it helped get my body, like just a weird humming at a certain tone. Cause I've always been interested in like Buddhist monks and, hmm the weird, strange noises that always make an eye work. And I'm like, oh, if you go at this tone, I can kind of get my body to uplift. And mm. and I've never been a big sort of, you know, I've always been like, ah, I don't know about this meditating kind of thing. It seems a bit sort of, you know, out of my sort of realm. But I had one of my my girlfriend's um, workmates sent me this, this, this audio that she did where she basically got me into a meditation, used her voice to, help me calm my nervous system and I never knew it was possible mm -hmm. I didn't know it was a, a thing um, and then heat something about heat works really well the sun works really well being in water um, and then eating the right foods too mm -hmm. trying to eat the right food is, is pretty helpful as well a friend of mine had a company that made this amazing CBD cream mm -hmm. that worked insanely well on nerve damage but it no mm -hmm. longer exists so oh. that was really really helpful um, I mean, getting off the really heavy meds, like the morphine and stuff and all those Percocet, whatever mm. they're all, I mean, that was insane in itself, but I really wanted to get out of that. Um, and I ended up using a lot of edibles, like mm. weed, uh, which was really helpful. Um, and then also mushrooms, because a small dose of mushrooms helps turn the pain into a, a different kind of pain. Mm. And then also the weed does the same thing too, where it helps kind of turn the pain into something a little bit more manageable. Um, but it's been really helpful just to try and get in a different space with with, with those. Um, and obviously not operate heavy machinery, but um, 
<laughs> it, 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 I'm trying to think what else has been helpful. There's, there's been a lot of things that I've tried everything. Mm. I mean, I've got like a thing of AFOs, like the the you know things you like ankle braces that for every you know I'm a footwear guy, so I <laughs> I bought everything and I'm like, all right, this works. We cut a bit of this out, put that in there. Um, and then the trainer guy that I work with, we're always jimmying these things. Like, how are we going to make you walk today? Um, every time I've gone to a doctor, I'm like, I'm not going back. Like, I just, mm. I mean, I'll go for checkups to see if everything's still aligned properly. But the, 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 the doctors are there to just do the, the heavy lifting, right? They're there to just fix do your the, surgery. Right, right. Do the scaffolding and fix the fundamentals of the foundation, right? And the rest of it's your job to work out how to, piece it all together. Mm. Um, Roma, Roma, am I right, saying it right? Right, yeah. Um, the brand you just created has been a huge part of your whole journey. Can you tell us about um, how it's kind of helped you keep moving through this? Right. So I'd always talk with a really good friend of mine about doing a footwear company together. And basically after my accident, I had I basically had my last pair of sample race boots and I think one of the EMTs took them and they disappeared um, after my accident. And I, I loved those shoes and I'd kept them for years. And I was basically like, I, yeah, I was in bed and I was like, all right, if I'm gonna be on the internet, I, we should do something and we should really start this company now. Um, and it was always gonna be a race. And I was like, I'm gonna build a racing shoe that I should have had in the car. Cause I think I would have had a little bit more control cause that one was a little bit too soft. Um, and it was almost creating something and we didn't really know what it was going to be. We, we spent ages trying to come up with a name and went all these legal things, but it was more of finding a focal point with somebody who happened to be a really good friend of mine that we'd done a lot of adventures together with and, um, that we could have a creative focal point. And I was like, if I focus on this, I can take myself away from this mm. and just be focused purely on this. And it's helped pull me out, you know, it's helped me kind of every day I'll set myself a task and you know, as long as you, you know, it's like chipping away at that block. Mm. As long as you chip, the, the, the rock's gonna crack at a certain mm -hmm. point. It's just how long do you have to chip away at it for? Um, so I think we, we approached it like that, you know, where we're just like chipping away bit by bit, doing what we like to do. And for me, it was like, I might not have been able to do, you know, two hours worth of work, but I could dedicate half an hour to it between gaps of pain or whatever. And, and it was literally that. Hmm. And it was just these gaps would get bigger and then we'd do a little bit more, we'd do a little bit more. And then he would help motivate me by seeing what he was doing. And then we'd started getting stuff developed in the factory and physical things would come. Mm. And so it started this nice yeah, exchange, yeah. which created a, just a nice Momentum. flow. Right, and it mm. kept me in the game, right? When I saw the world like passing me by and everyone's starting all these, Instagram businesses or whatever. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm sinking kind of thing, right? Because um, truly, truly, yeah, truly mm. helped me kind of come out and do do something, you know? I mean, I don't know where it's gonna go, but it's just good vibes and good energy. And we're just trying to put out good vibes and good energy, you know, mm. um, through the guise of motorsport is kind of the idea. Um, something awesome. we really, enjoy doing right and making beautiful shoes is the real goal as well so beautiful what has this whole experience taught you are you living differently now huh hmm. <laughs> i mean i'm living differently just because of my physical yeah. ailments but yeah i think to never give up to always just follow your gut and just don't don't back down, you know? No matter what happens to you, I think you just gotta keep keep pushing, you know? Like we get, and, I, and it's, I get all emotional because it's like, because I feel like I get a second chance, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't get a second go. Um, and it, you, you, just to never give up and do what you truly believe in, you know? I mean, I've been in places of opportunity and taken the opportunities and been very lucky in what I've managed to achieve in my career. and. I believe it's through just following what you like to do and somehow finding a way through it, you know? And this is the same thing where just never giving up on myself and knowing and always in the back of my head, I'm like 100%, 100%, I gotta keep, you're allowed to rest, but you gotta get up tomorrow and do it again, do it again. And just just not letting off, you know? Um, and I think it, uh, 
And I kind of want to go back to, it makes me remember, so like back in the beginning when I was in bed and I was paralyzed, there was a moment where I did like an edible and I felt my body energy. Like I felt like I, I was almost like doing a body check of like, I could feel like almost this rainbow color going around my body. Because mm -hmm. before I doubted, like I was like, can I really get out of this? Is this, can I really get out of bed and walk again kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And that kind of really helped me. That's the point I go back to in my head when I'm thinking of giving up. I'm like, you remember that? That's the energy point of like, you, your body has it all. You just got to keep working at it. You got to keep working at it till it's, and the way I see it too is like, cause I do so much work on my feet, like physically and my legs. It's almost like I'm like a Play-Doh figure that I'm remolding back into what I want it to be. Mm. And every day I remold my feet back into the shape they should be, my legs into the shape they should be, cause I want to get back to, so it, it, it's, yeah, it's like the never, the, the never giving up, you know? Um, you can't. Do you feel um, on a spiritual level this has changed you? Maybe a little bit. I think I always had a little bit of a spirituality side to everything where I, you know, um, if anything, it's helped reinforce a lot of things that I already thought about instinct, about belief systems, about having faith in yourself and then like the energy of people and the goodness of people. And if anything, it's reinforced all of that, all the stuff I think I've always believed, it's really helped as I grow older, like reinforce everything that there is a lot of goodness everywhere and that, mm. that maybe people are looking in the wrong places for, mm. the, for things and you, you just got to keep looking for what you're looking for, you know? Mm. Um, when you were at your lowest, how did you begin to find hope? Um, first of all, my surname is Hope. So there's always hope, <laughs> right? As my school teachers used kind to tell me. Kind of amazing, me. Right. your sermon, your right. surname is Hope. <laughs> so I, I, I took it down to binary, like I, because uh, I spent days, weeks in bed, right? And so you're always spinning with things. And I, I like basically took it down to, yeah, binary, like zero and one or on off switch. Everything in the world is on or off. Um, and it was basically like, I, I put that logic into my head of like, right, I've got to start making a, some yeses and some movement in the right direction. I can lay here all day and feel sorry for myself, but I have to work on a plan that starts getting me heading in the right direction. Mm. So it might've been, you know, two yeses this way for rolling over in bed and one no of like, no, I can't get back on my stomach kind of thing. But then to me, it was like, but I did it, I did that, mm. and I can do that again tomorrow. And then it would be like these real slow things of things I could do mm. or, um, yeah, there was stuff like when, I mean, hopefully no one ever has to experience this, but when they had done the, the hardware on my back, there's no muscle groups, there's no nerves that, I mean, the nerves are going crazy. The bones against bone, there's hardware just freshly drilled in. That was the point of like, I'm over, like I'm done, I don't know, I can't even move. This is so painful, I think I might have broken the hardware. And that was another thing, you read all these things online. And um, so you have to get in this space of like, all right, I've got to start with stepping stones. If I felt like it was like a wall that I used to have that would defend me from certain things mm. and the wall had collapsed. So I was like, I've got to build this wall of resilience back up. And bit by bit with these yeses, I can mm. start, you know, whatever it might be like, wiggling a toe or just lifting some weights or something or making sure I ate something healthy or hydrating enough or not taking two of the pills out of the mix. Mm. And it was as simple as that. And it was like, that's progression. And it was, it was those little things that really helped me because they're all in front of me, you know? And it was like every day you stare at the same thing and like, oh man, I'm going crazy. I'm and then the pills make you crazy. So I kind of had to formulate a plan of like, just yes or yes and try not to say no and try and, mm. I mean, even coming here today, when you asked me, I knew it probably wasn't a great idea for me getting on an airplane just because of how difficult it sometimes can be. But I was like, right, it's another yes. Like just say yes mm -hmm. and just work out how you're going to do it later. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, it's great because I did it, right? And it's like, you, you, and it's the first time I've traveled on my own in you know nearly five years. And, um, and it's, just another one of those stepping stones of like, I did that, I did it, that's mm. another yes, great. And as long as you can kind of steer it like that, then you can slowly, 
And again, it comes to the sort of rock analogy of like, just chip away little, little bits at a time, you know? And you'll slowly, slowly step out, step out, step out, and it, and it works. And then once, you, you know, you reflect on it after like six months, you're like, oh damn, that shit that I was doing really works. That, that mental state of trying to get through this or getting out of the shower and trying to hold on and like, you know, and, and, and or even getting to the shower, right? It's, um, it's truly humbling <laughs> when you can't do that, right? Um, because I think our heads try and get ahead of ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And they're always like, oh, we're going to do this and it. And it's like, it was really pulling it all back and be like, just be good with this. Mm -hmm. And every positive is brilliant. And mm -hmm. you just keep doing the little positives. You're like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. right? Little celebrations. And and I'd even do that to myself where I'd kind of clap for myself. I'm like, yay, you know, because I'd be like highly medicated at home. Like, ooh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so good. So it's... um. Yeah, setting a, setting a target, I think is the, yeah, the real one. It's, it's like the same thing in the beginning. It's going back to the running race. Mm. It's knowing what you want the end of the race to be and where you want to be. And then it's managing how do you get mm. through that. Mm. We really don't know what we're made of until we're faced with these challenges. Right. And I think that, yeah, that's a real, so we ha I have this conversation with my, with my, um, my friend who's, who's paralyzed and yeah, we call each other like ninjas because we're like, nobody knows the amount of pain that we go through to do this. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> so the, bi the binary thing really helped me, like little footsteps. Yeah, baby steps. And just seeing it as positive footsteps in the right direction was really what was truly helpful. And it's like, and just staying headstrong is really key, mm. so. Thank you, Anthony. Oh, thanks. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate it. It's been, no, it's super interesting. It's, like, <laughs> it's good to talk about it, right? It's good to get it out. If you enjoyed this conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. You can connect with Into Healing on TikTok and Instagram for more inspirational and behind-the-scenes content, and visit our website, intohealing.com, for transcripts and other goodies. Into Healing is made possible thanks to people like you. Contributions made through Venmo at Into Healing or through our website IntoHealing.com help us bring you more inspiring episodes. This has been Into Healing with Mira Adura. Thank you for joining us.